So let me get right to it. Um, the End of History was written uh, 30 years ago in, uh, it came out in, in the summer, well actually it's 30 and a half years, more like 31 years. It was published in uh, June of 1989. I was in the State Department at the time, so it was before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and I have now spent 31 years being asked, well, what about the end of history, you know? <laughs> wasn't that completely wrong? And, you know, and it, this didn't start recently. I mean, this started virtually the moment I published that piece. So I just want to get a couple of things out, uh, just so there's not any misunderstanding. The end of history was not my phrase. It comes from the philosopher Hegel. History, in his understanding, is what we would today call modernization or development. And end did not mean termination, it meant objective, you know, target. And so the question of the end of history is where does the modernization process lead to? What's the highest form of human social and political organization? And what I said was the Marxists for the last 150 years have been saying the end of history is going to be communism. And my observation in really the summer of 1988 or the winter of 1988-89, uh, when Gorbachev was reforming the Soviet Union was that it, it didn't look like we would get there, uh, that we would stop at the stage before communism, which the Marxists called bourgeois democracy. Uh, and I didn't see a higher form of, of society uh, that would replace uh, liberal democracy. All right, so that was the thesis. Uh, so people keep asking me, do I still believe it? I believe it in the following form. I do not, uh, I have not heard anyone posit an alternative uh, political economic form other than liberal democracy tied to a market economy that I think will be a higher form of human uh, civilization that will produce higher levels of prosperity and more happiness for the people that live in it. Uh, the only alternative that I think is a serious one is actually the one that the Chinese are have been developing because it's definitely not democratic uh, and it's been quite successful economically. And I've always said right from the beginning that you know another 20 years or so, if they're richer than the United States and they're still stable and it looks like it's an ongoing enterprise, then I'll admit I was wrong. There really is an alternative and uh, that may be it. But I don't really, I, I have reasons for thinking that may not be the case. Now, if you fast forward 30 years, obviously, we're living in a very different period. We're not expanding the ro uh, world uh, democracies anymore the way we were in 1989. And in fact, we've been in a period of setback. Uh, it's taken two forms. So one is the rise of Russia and China, authoritarian regimes that are very uh, aggressive and self-confident. Uh, and the other form is the rise of populism in the United States, in Britain, in Hungary, in Poland, in Italy, in any number of other uh, countries. The problem with populism is uh, it's not democracy because these populist leaders are legitimately elected by the people. The problem is that they almost always attack the liberal part of liberal democracy, meaning the constitutional order, checks and balances, the rule of law. Uh, they don't like anything that gets in the way of their implementation of the people's so-called people's will. Uh, and that includes, unfortunately, my president, Donald Trump, who the moment he came into office uh, set about trying to undermine all of the institutions in the United States that limit executive power. And I think a lot of us in the US are really scared of what's gonna happen if this guy gets reelected in November because he's going to feel that the American people really uh, have given him a mandate to keep doing what he's doing in a way that really doesn't know any kinds of bounds, institutional uh, bounds. And this has already happened in Hungary. I mean, it's going on in any number of other countries, and that, I think, is the other big danger that we face. Now, I just want to say, so I want to connect the end of history and the last man to my latest book, Identity, uh, just to point out um, that there is actually some continuity there. Uh, by the way, people keep asking me, have you ever considered rewriting the end of history on The Last Man? And I, my answer is, I've done it already. Uh, I have a two-volume 
a book that runs to about 1,200 pages called The Origins of Political Order and then Political Order and Political Decay. And that basically is my rewriting of the end of history and the last man. And there's some important differences uh, in my perspective because in the latter two volumes, I talk about political decay, that societies can go backwards uh, as well as going uh, forwards. And I think I appreciate better how hard it is to create a modern uh, impersonal state and, and so forth. So if you're interested in that, I, <laughs> I would send you to those books. But the last book, Identity, has a lot of continuity with the end of history and the last man. The last man in the title of the book comes from the philosopher Nietzsche. And he said that at the end of history, the last man will appear. The last man is a man without a chest, with no pride or anger or aspiration because all of his needs have been taken care of. You know, he has peace and security and prosperity. And people are going to rebel against this. And I said this in the end of History and the Last Man, talking about future threats to democracy, that people want to struggle. And if their society doesn't give them things to struggle against that are just, they're going to struggle for unjust things. Uh, and that this was a per perpetual uh, challenge. I mentioned Donald Trump back in that original book. Uh, at that time, I thought that one of the advantages of a capitalist uh, economic system was that these fantastically ambitious people like Trump could be satisfied just by making a lot of money. Uh, and that would bleed off all their energy and then and that would keep the political system safe from, you know, a new Julius Caesar. And uh, little did I know that he actually failed as a businessman. He went bankrupt twice. So then he goes into reality TV and becomes a, you know, a reality TV star. And in order to get the recognition, which is the real driver behind identity, uh, he runs for president and now we're stuck with him. Uh, but the important concept that was embedded there is uh, something based on this Greek word thumos. Thumos is a part of the human psychology that demands respect and recognition. And if you do not get respect or recognition, uh, you get angry. So in modern Greek, as I understand it, the, the word thumos still exists and it means anger. Uh, and I think a lot of politics, modern politics, is actually about a struggle for recognition, that people don't just want peace and security and, and prosperity, they want respect and dignity. They want the public recognition of that dignity. And I think what's happened in the last few years is that globalization has produ produced a large class of people in many countries that do not feel respected. Uh, it's been great for elites, you know, the kind of people that go to the Munich Security Conference uh, and are cosmopolitan and well-connected to the global economy. But there's a lot of people that have less education. Uh, their jobs have been taken away as a result of outsourcing and downsizing and so forth. Uh, and they're really pretty unhappy that the elites really don't take them very seriously, don't even recognize uh, their struggles. And I think a lot of populism has arisen because of this thumos, you know, this anger at non-recognition. And what these populist politicians do is they, they, they feed on that and they are able to blame foreigners, uh, whether foreign competitors or immigrants, uh, working together with the elites that have structured uh, the game against them. And that's really what, you know, I think is undermining our liberal democracy uh, right now. And so uh, I think that that's the kind of dilemma we're in that people don't just want uh, peace and prosperity, they also want respect. And our system doesn't give it to them uh, in, in, you know, it, it, there, there are lots of groups that really don't get that. On the, on the left, you know, they tend to be uh, identity groups like, you know, racial minorities, immigrants, women, gays and lesbians. On the right now, we're seeing basically the old majority white working class uh, rising up and saying, well, what about us? You know, you're paying all this attention to women and, 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 and blacks and, and gays and so forth, but what about us ordinary people? We're not getting respect either. And that's the, you know, the unfortunate kind of polarization uh, that we're seeing now. Uh, so that, you know, uh, is a way of tying together 
the first book I wrote and the latest book I wrote because they're actually dealing with the same, in many ways, with the same phenomenon. I'm not going to make any predictions about how this is all going to end up. Uh, I tend to think that um, people have gotten a little bit too pessimistic uh, about the prospects for democracy because people really don't like living in authoritarian countries, and we've seen that, you know, in uh, in Georgia, in uh, Ukraine, in Sudan, in Algeria, uh, in Nicaragua, in, in uh, Hong Kong, in a lot of other places. Uh, and so I think that there's still, you know, this hunger for a kind of just and free order. But getting to that, uh, uh, as I put it in another book, getting to Denmark is not that easy. Uh, and I think that that's where uh, we've fallen down. So I'll just stop with that.